All right, here's how it goes. Here's how the dilemma is presented to Christians, uh, often by Muslims or by others who would want to challenge the deity of Christ. Um, heretical groups, groups that want to teach something other than the deity of Christ, they'll say something like this. And I want you to put yourself in the position of someone who has to actually answer this question, right? Um, does God know everything? And then, of course, your answer is going to be, if you're a Christian, yes, God knows everything. And then you say, is Jesus God? And you go, yeah, yeah, Jesus is God. And then they ask you the third question, does Jesus know everything? And then you think, well, yes, if God knows everything and Jesus is God, then clearly Jesus knows everything. And then they take you to Mark 13, verse 32, where Jesus says that there's something he doesn't know. Let's look at this verse. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. And so this becomes the dilemma. This is the passage we happen to be in as I'm teaching verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. <clears throat> I like to just tackle stuff as it comes in this series in particular, going you know through verse by verse teaching. I just take things as they come. And what comes up here is like the Muslim challenge you know, to, to the Christian belief in the deity of Christ. And I think it's very important that we don't react wrongly to the challenge uh, where we actually say, what does this mean? Like, how is it that Jesus doesn't know something, didn't know something? What does that mean? And I've got a list of questions that come up when I inter encounter this verse and this passage in Mark. And we're going to answer those questions today in our Mark series. If this is your first time, uh, I'm Pastor Mike Winger. I teach the Bible. I do verse by verse teaching, apologetics, theology, defending the Christian faith, explaining the Christian faith, responding to a weird theological trends that are going on in our culture and trying to do so with uh, hopefully a, a head and heart that's chasing after Jesus and helping you to do the same thing. So um, let's look at this stuff in context. It doesn't refute the deity of Christ, right? But just saying that doesn't refute Jesus's deity, that's not good enough. We have to really understand what this teaches us about the nature or natures, plural, of Christ. What are his natures and how can we understand them? And I think that this is actually a neat passage because as we'll find, it, it defeats Islam. <laughs> it, not only does it does it still teach the deity of Christ, but it actually defeats and destroys Islamic theology. You have to understand that one of the core tenets of Islamic theology is that Jesus is not the son of God. And this verse that is often used by Muslims to try to refute Christianity is refuting Islam. But let's get into it by just first reading the passage thoughtfully, Consider these things, think about these things, and then we'll we'll dig deep. We will dig deep today. So Mark 13, 32, it says, But of that day or hour, no one knows. And Jesus is speaking about the hour of his coming, the, the, the end time stuff. He goes, No one knows the day or the hour. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed and keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed times will come time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert." So this is, this is, um, yeah, this is it. I, I think this is the end of like our eschatology stuff in the gospel of Mark. I don't know if there's any significant eschatology stuff as I'm scanning in my head real quick coming up, uh, not, not real significant stuff, no major things, uh, for the gospel of Mark in particular, this is the final day. We'll deal with some of that stuff as well. Eschatology meaning end times or what Christians think is going to happen in the future, that kind of thing. Um, the that day he's talking about is clearly the day of the coming of Christ. No one knows that. And let's just start by answering the Christological question. The question that has to do with the natures of who Christ is. And I'm using the word natures plural for, for a very specific reason here. But I'll explain that later. Um, how could the son of God not know? How could the son not know? And there are, I'm going to present three theories that people like to offer on this. And we're going to analyze them. I'll defend the third theory. The first two I'll just mention. The first theory is the, the sort of the Muslim theory or the theory that is often carried by those who, are, who don't believe in the, in the deity of Christ. And they will say, like I mentioned to you earlier, right? God is omniscient. That's premise one in their argument. Premise two is Jesus is not omniscient, right? There's something he doesn't know. And then conclusion, therefore, Jesus is not God. And it seems like a really tight, logical argument. And in a sense, it is. But I would suggest that you guys first notice this. Um, this is not an argument that says 
scripture's teaching you that Jesus isn't God. Rather, it's an argument that says, scripture's teaching you Jesus didn't know something. And I'm telling you, logically, he cannot therefore be God. So you get this. This is not an argument that the Bible teaches Jesus isn't God. This is important. It's an argument that the incarnation is logically impossible. That's a different argument, and it's a much more bold argument than people realize. And that's actually its weakness. It's really an argument that the incarnation is impossible. Yet if we have scripture that teaches that Jesus is God and teaches that Jesus also didn't know something, then we have the full biblical teaching that Jesus is God and there was something he didn't know. And we have to explain that. I agree. We have to explain that. But you can't say that he therefore can't be God. That's your your philosophy being forced upon scripture. You're not letting scripture speak at that point. So um, that to me is not a very powerful argument, but we'll answer it as well as we go on. Uh, now, a second theory, a second theory of the three is, and this I think was Martin Luther's position on the topic, but it's also been held by various people in church history, is that this just doesn't mean what you think it means. When it says that no one knows the day or the hour, the son doesn't know, it's just a, a, a figure of speech. And what Jesus is really saying here is not that he's not cognizant or aware of when this time is going to be. Instead, he's saying that it's not him who's deciding the time. He's not choosing the time. Um, now, in other words, it's when, when he says, I don't know, He's really mean, saying, it's not in my authority. And they go to Acts chapter 1, because in Acts 1, Jesus says, the authority of when this time will come is in the Father's hands. It's in the Father. It's the Father who's deciding when it will happen. Um, this is not actually a very popular theory, you know, it, and it doesn't look like it works. Like, it looks like you're just trying to get away from it, because then you don't even have Jesus not knowing something. You can say Jesus is fully omniscient at all times, in all ways, and um, he, he's, he's presently aware of the time and hour. It, you just mi misread the passage. I don't think this works with the passage, though. I don't think it works with the passage at all. I'm not going to go into a big, long thing about it, but just look at it. He goes, I don't know, you don't know. And their question is, when is it going to happen? When's it going to happen? He goes, you don't know, I don't know. Only, only the Father knows. The context of all that isn't about, they're not saying, Jesus, who gets to pick when it happens? There's, that's not what they're asking him. They're asking when, and he tells them, no one knows. So... The context doesn't work with the authority claim, and the word no here probably doesn't fit that either. So the third response, which I think is the right response, the right theory or interpretation of Jesus not knowing the day or the hour, is to say that this is just how the incarnation works. This is, and, and keep, hear me out, that's how the incarnation, that, that phrase incarnation, it means in the flesh or in a body, Jesus comes in a human body. That's just how it works when God comes in human form. It, it works that way because he's truly human. Now, our tendency, this is something we're not used to, and I wasn't used to it years ago. Uh, we tend to want to defend the deity of Christ. And, and you might look at this passage and think, how do I defend the deity of Christ? But, but really, this passage is about helping to reassure us of the humanity of Christ. It's not a challenge to his deity because Christian doctrine has always held that Jesus is God and man, two natures, right? He has, he's, he's deity and human, both. So if he's God and man, this passage is giving us both in one verse. He's the son of the father and he's also a human. Um, our tendency, again, is to emphasize the deity of Christ and to think that the battlegrounds are all about the deity of Jesus. And I think because of this, we sometimes are a little bit less grateful for what Jesus did when he came in his humility. And how, I mean, how much our Lord suffered for us, how much Jesus really went through. It's not like Jesus was like Superman. Like if you watch the old, old Superman, Christopher Reeves, right? You watch the old Superman. He'll like pretend he gets hurt or that he can't carry something or lift something. But we all know it's a joke because he's not really being hurt. He's, he's not being injured at all. There's no suffering. There's no difficulty going on for him. He's just pretending to be a normal human. That's what Clark, Clark Kent's not a real person. Not a, it's just a fabrication. And some would, would picture Christ as though he was just, he just looked like he was in human form. He didn't really come and take on actual humanity. That was actually an early church heresy. This is something that was going on in the, in the very early church. And, the, and I'll talk more about this in a bit. But the Bible like really emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. He was truly a human and he was truly God. Both are true. So let me point out some other areas in the scripture where you might have missed this. And you need to absorb this. This is what the Bible is telling us about the nature of Christ. Not only is there something he didn't know. Let me add more. Let me make the problem bigger <laughs> so you realize you have to accept it. Uh, Luke 2.52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus increased in wisdom. Now, this is Jesus when he's 12. 
in Luke 2. He's 12. He visits the temple. He's there having discussions with the leaders and teachers. And he, he then grows from 12 until the next time you see him in, in any of the gospels, right? Especially Luke. He's like, he's like about 30 years old. And it tells us about the in-between time. It just says he increased in wisdom. Now, how can God increase in wisdom? I mean, how could even Jesus increase in wisdom? He is the wisdom of God, scripture tells us, 1 Corinthians, right? He's, he's God's wisdom. He is the way, the truth, and the life. How can he increase in wisdom? I'm going to say what we have to do is grant he can increase in wisdom. And our question is how, not whether he does or not, because he, clearly he does. He cannot know something. We just have to ask how that works with our understanding of who Jesus is. And the answer is just what the church has believed about the, the incarnation for a very long time. Another spot here is Matthew 4, 2. I think this is um, another significant passage that you should think about. And after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Now, this may not seem like that's significant. He became hungry. So no, Jesus became hungry because humans can become hungry. Yet God doesn't get hungry. God's never like, boy, I need to eat or I will die. That doesn't happen to God because in his deity, there's no need. But when he took on humanity, the humanness of Christ had a need to eat. So he's human. Like there's, there's actually like a true humanity that's going on here. Um, now the error is in thinking that Jesus is only human, that that's all he is, that if he's human, he can't be God, that he can't be both. The Bible clearly, te clearly teaches he's both. It just straight up calls Jesus God in places. And, and then some people go, well, why didn't Jesus say, I am God and use those exact words? And I'm just like, this is a great way for you to ignore what Jesus actually said. <laughs> this is not, this is not clever. This, this is right up there with the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, which is like literally a, a total distraction from the issue. The doctrine of the Trinity is taught in the Bible. That's the issue. That's the only question we have. Um, at any rate, here's a question to, to show you, demonstrate the humanity of Christ to us all, right? How much do you think Jesus could bench press? Think about it. How much could he bench press? Now, I, I Googled real quick, like, what's the typical weight someone could bench press? So I, I, I you know, I, I went on the upper end for average and said 180, right, Jesus? Because I want to make him, I want to make him strong, you know? Some people want to make him really kind of a sissy, like the Renaissance artists that just make... Everyone into girly, girly guys. <laughs> there was like a weird thing where the holier somebody was, the more feminine they made them. Um, I, actually, that's coming back <laughs> in our culture today. So the idea, though, is Jesus, like, let's say he could bench press 180 pounds, right? He, but that's humanly. I mean, he's, he's God. He could just command the moon to explode, and it would. That's it. Like, there's no limit to what he could bench press in his divine power. But in his human abilities, there's a limit. That's the simple answer to this question. How could Jesus not know and know at the same time? There's more we'll have to discuss, but I think that gets you going. There's a human, there's a true human nature in Christ. He divinely could do anything, but he limited himself. He didn't access, he didn't use those powers. He tried to, uh, in, in most cases, using his human abilities. And we'll talk more about the details of how that plays out in a second. Um, now let's talk about how this <clears throat> works. It, it's easy to think about the bench press example, I think. I think people get that. They go, yeah, humanly, he could bench press a certain amount. Divinely, he could do any, anything. But when you talk about his knowledge, this is where it feels different, right? It feels like when you say he couldn't lift that rock that size, but divinely he could. If you say that, I get that. But with, with his knowledge, it feels a little different. Um, but in scripture, there's times where Jesus seems to know things supernaturally. He seems to have a supernatural knowledge. I'll give you several examples. Gospel of John is, is a, the easiest place to find the specific uh, verses. John 2, 24, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them all, to them, for he knew all men. So there's some sort of sense in which he knows all men. Uh, he knows their basic nature. He understands them. There's a sense in which Jesus knows people that goes, I think, beyond the natural. There's like a, there's like divine knowledge that's going on there. In Matthew 4, 2, we can read about it again. I'm sorry, um, John 6, 64. So Jesus talks about how some of them don't believe, but then look at the commentary on this, right? John's divinely inspired commentary led by the spirit. He writes, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Now think about this. The things that Jesus did know divinely, like Judas is going to betray me. They're going to crucify me. They're going to drive nails through my hands. They're going to beat me. My own people will betray me. Peter will deny me three times. These things are the things he supernaturally knows. The stuff he did know was like hard stuff to deal with and know. What he doesn't know at that time is the day and the hour of his return. 
It's interesting because that's the glorious moment. Th this meant that Jesus's knowledge would have been a hardship for him in some in some cases, in many cases, the things he did divinely know. He knew what was in man. I don't even want to know what's in you guys, all right? <laughs> I don't want you to know what's in me. Look, I am only sustained by the grace of God every moment. Um, that knowledge is not pleasurable knowledge to really know what's in the heart of man. So it just that, that just strikes me as being an additional struggle that Jesus went through that many of us don't appreciate. So in Jesus' knowledge, he seems to know certain things, like in the passages I just I just gave you, he seems to know things. Um, he knew who it was who would betray him. And then in uh, John 1, we have an interesting example of him having like sort of supernatural knowledge or awareness of Nathaniel. Nathaniel comes uh, to meet him and Jesus says, behold, is an Israelite indeed in whom there's no deceit. Nathaniel says, how do you know me? Jesus answered and tells him, hey, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I saw you. And there he was, uh, impossible to physically see him. And Nathaniel just immediately goes, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Like, this is all the evidence he needs. Like, you knew I was over, under the fig tree. Uh, this was a uh, knowledge that proved the identity of Christ to Nathaniel. Um, that was supernatural knowledge. Okay, in John 16, 30, in John 21, 17, also Philip and Peter both state that Jesus knows all things. All things. So there's some sense in which Jesus is omniscient. But there's another sense in which Jesus doesn't know. Now, that's a full biblical teaching. If you want to be one of those who wants to try to chop the Bible up and try to make it contradict, be my guest. Don't call that Christianity. If you have a biblical view, if you have a Christian view, you must affirm that Jesus knew all things and there was at least one thing, perhaps several things, he did not know. At the same time, how do you affirm this? It's the two natures of Christ. He has divine nature. He has human nature. This, this is my th thought on these things. The way the Bible teaches about God, about the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, it forces upon you the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the two natures of Christ with, with one person. These, that's, that's the historical Christian you know, creeds and stuff is that Jesus has two natures, divine and human, but there's only one person who is Jesus, right? Two natures, but one person. Just as there are in the Trinity, there's three persons, but one God. It's not three persons equal one person. It's three persons, one God. Anyway, this is this is forced upon you by the teaching of Scripture. Here, Jesus' Jesus's identity as God and man is being forced upon us by this idea of his omniscience and his lack of knowledge at the same time. It's not a contradiction because it's by virtue of different natures that he is, by virtue of his divinity, he's omniscient. By virtue of his humanity, he can have limited knowledge. Uh, one way to put this is limited, limiting himself in his access to his knowledge. So I'll put it this way. Jesus voluntarily limited his use of power and his use of his divine knowledge as part of the incarnation. Humanly, Jesus did not know the day or the hour and chose not to access that divine omniscience, which would have given him the answer. He could have had it. Someone's trying to call me, but I don't care about them. Actually, I, it's probably spam. <laughs> um, so um, I do care about them, but I'm not going to answer the call. Because someone's like, you don't know, you don't know I'm joking. I don't actually not care about people. I care about everybody. I love everybody perfectly in every possible way. That was also a joke, if you can't tell. So he uh, voluntarily limits the use of divine power. This is, again, just the two natures. The Bible affirms both of these. Christians have to affirm both of these. And if you affirm both of these, answering the question of how Jesus couldn't know something or didn't know something is easy. It's easy. right? The incarnation, the doctrine of the, of the Trinity, the doctrine of the two natures of Christ, this is a solution to what the Scripture keeps pushing on us with who Jesus is. It's However, something that's missed, as I've said earlier, is missed on, on us, like us 21st century Christians, is that we tend to forget that the humanity of Jesus, knowing that he's truly human, is maybe equally important as knowing he's truly divine. He's God with us, but you, you can't just emphasize the deity. You have to emphasize the humanity of Christ. In the early church, this was a huge issue. There were those who actually taught that Jesus was not even really a human. So you all know the footprints in the sand story, which, which I like. Okay, I, I, and, you know, if you think it's scripture, that's weird, right? But I think it's a wonderful poem that teaches a lesson that that reminds us of a truth. Like I, I like footprints in the sand. I don't think that's and people. So we're also so critical of everything nowadays, um, but but I like it. I think it's great. So um, I don't want to stretch it too far, but I think it's good. But there is an old footprints in the sand. There's like a second century footprints in the sand story. Did you know this? It's in a Gnostic gospel. 
Now, if you haven't heard of this, when I say Gnostic gospel, Gnostic is a religious group, not Christians. They would pretend that other religions were, you know, they would pretend to be Christian. They're totally not Christian. But they have a Gnostic gospel, meaning, you know, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, they would write some of their own. They'd be like, well, this is the gospel of Peter. This is the gospel of Judas. This is the gospel of Mary. And they would write these fabricated fake or forged gospels to try to put their teachings in there because they're trying to draw Christians away to their false beliefs. So if they can attach their beliefs to Jesus, then they win, right? Well, these gospels, um, none of them are in your Bible, of course. They're all just, you could read them in church history. You could you could find them online for free even though. And they're weird reading, that's for sure. One of them tells a story of a, a disciple walking with Jesus on the sand, footprints in the sand. And they're walking on the sand and Jesus walks with them. And at some point, the disciple turns back and he looks, and ironically, he only sees one set of footprints. Isn't that interesting? Except in this version of footprints in the sand, it's not Jesus's footprints. The footprints he sees are his own. And the revelation, the Gnostic thought, is Jesus, he left no footprints because he wasn't really human, because he wasn't really there. This was something that was going on in the early church, the teaching that Jesus was never really human at all. He was just the sort of like manifestation of divinity here in some sense or an emanation of part of the Pleroma if you're if you're Gnostic. And so don't worry about all that. Forget about it. I'll do it some other day. But 1 John 4 verses 2 and 3 reveals to us like the early church responding to this, probably dealing with some of the proto or early beginnings of Gnosticism. Uh, John writes, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, right? That's the incarnation. He came in the flesh. Carne, carne asada, right? We're talking about meat. He came in actual human form. This is this is emphasized not only, like it's essential. Like he goes, you deny the, 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 the humanity of Christ. You are not, it's not from God. This is this should have defeated Gnosticism for anybody who would take the authentic writings of the, of the scriptures. But um, the... Uh, this is something Jesus also re-emphasized after his resurrection. Not only did he live a human life, die, physically rise from the dead, but then he he like has, goes to great lengths to show the, the disciples, like, it's me. He tells them it's not a ghost. He goes, give me some food, and he eats in front of them. He's doing all these things to show them he's real. This is, He's not just hungry. He's trying to demonstrate, I'm physically, bodily raised to life because he's truly human. This is how Jesus can represent you and me on the cross, right? Adam represents us in the garden. Jesus represents us in the cross. Just as we get drugged down in the fall of Adam, we rise up with Christ when we trust in him because he is the new Adam, the second Adam, the human to represent all humans, the one to stand in our place. His humanity is really stinking important. And that's what this verse is helping to show us. There's something he didn't know. Why? Because he really did limit himself in ways as a human. So that that's pretty significant. Um, let's talk now about how unaware Jesus was. Here's one of the questions I come up with. And for you guys who want like Bible study tips, here's a here's a tip. Um, read a passage and then write down, just write down a list of questions that come up as you read the passage. I think questions are better than observations. Usually people go observe, interpret, apply. And I think observation is a difficult step for people and it's not in terribly fruitful a lot of the time. I would, uh, to be honest, <laughs> um, not that it's a bad idea. It's just pragmatically it not, may not be the best way to do observing. It, observing is to say, make observations. I say ask questions uh, because I have to observe to, to ask questions. And then I'm asking questions of the passage. It forces me to go back to the passage to look for those answers. So one of the questions I wrote down re looking at this passage was how unaware was Christ? Like how unaware was he? To what degree? And, and here's um, my theory on how this worked. My theory is this, that Jesus would would limit himself, and, and I, I throw out the word theory there on purpose. Okay, this is what I think. There could be different ways of trying to, you know, piece together the gray areas here. Um, so my thought is this. Jesus generally kept himself from his omniscience, like like closing your eyes, you know, and not using that vision. That You have that ability, you're just not using it. So he, he just kept himself from it, having a human mind, a human brain, I should say, excuse me, I don't want to get into the mind discussion, but a human brain that, that is limited in its capacities would allow him an easy avenue for limiting access to his own omniscience. But I think that when he did access omniscience, it was at the Father's instruction, specifically. So like God the Father, he's in constant submission, being an example for us. 
He's specifically moment to moment getting instruction, knowledge, direction from the Father. It may come from his own power, but I think it's coming at the permission of the Father, right? I, I think that that's it. Um, I just watched Incredibles the other day. Let me give you an example that just popped into my mind. Here's an analogy from a movie that's not Lord of the Rings. Um, so I watched Incredibles, and at the end of the film, there's the the son, um, Dash, right? His name is Dash. It's a great movie, by the way. Incredibles was incredible. Uh, but the son, Dash, he, 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 he enters a race, but he's like faster than anybody in the world, right? So his parents don't want him to overdo it. And so during the race, he's running and he keeps looking at his dad and his mom to get instructions from them on how fast he should run. And they're like, go faster. And he gets ahead and they're like, oh no, slow down, slow down, not that fast. And they tell him, come in second, close second. And then he's just, he could easily race off as fast as he wants, but he's listening and submitting to their instruction. I think this is a cheesy example, I admit, but I think that it's an illustration that might help me make my point about Jesus receiving moment-to-moment -moment direction from the Father about what he would do or not do, when he would heal, when he would not heal. I think he has the power to do those things, but he's not accessing it, but by the Father's will. Now, why do I say this? Uh, John 5.19. John 5.19, it says, Jesus speaking himself, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does also does in like manner. This is active sense of the verb he sees this is like an ongoing seeing so it's not just that jesus was following a plan that was laid out ahead of time in some cases that's true when it comes to the cross jesus knows well ahead of time he prophesies it he talks about the details of it he's going to die and rise again he's not in the dark about his mission but it may be that moment to moment that he goes somewhere and while he's there god re the father reveals to him this is the thing that i'm wanting you to do right now and he just does it in the moment. It was just like perfect obedience, moment to moment. Then um, we have uh, John 8, 28 that may also support this. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do not, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things, these things as the Father taught me. So he doesn't do it under his own initiative. Jesus is being initiated by the Father. That, that's what I'm say, suggesting, this sort of like moment-to-moment -moment direction and directives. So in that moment, the Father's like, this knowledge is not for you to have right now. And the Son, who is God in the flesh, is so humble as to not just access that knowledge, which he could access freely if he chose. I think that's pretty interesting. I think it's consistent scripturally, and I think it makes a lot of sense of when Jesus would use a supernatural ability versus not. I think that's right there. Now, notice this. Mark drops a, a... We've seen it in the Mark series. If you guys have been following with me in the whole series, and there's a playlist down below if you want to check out the entire Mark series. But Mark drops these subtle bombs, the Gospel of Mark, these subtle bombs uh, that are just like deep and meaningful and powerful teaching about the deity and person of Christ. And this, again, this is one of those passages. As, as much as people want to use it to fight the deity of Jesus, it actually teaches his deity as well as his humanity it teaches both it's only a problem if you think you have to pick between the two but notice the order that we have here in mark 13. this is so cool and if a muslim asks you about this passage this is what you need to respond this is like your response has got to involve what i'm about to tell you right now jesus says of that day or, or hour no one knows so he says no one knows that implies no humans know this is humans hearing it their first thought is no people know they're not thinking of angels or or you know spirit beings they're not thinking of animals right? they're thinking of people no one knows then the next step up not even the angels in heaven that's above people angels know more than you generally speaking right then he goes up another step nor the sun why is that significant for a few reasons one if you're muslim then it is considered shirk one of the worst sins in islam for you to declare that jesus is the son of god Yet in this very passage that Muslims most frequently want to use to try to say Jesus wasn't God's son, I mean, that's their ultimate goal here, it teaches, it has Jesus himself declaring he's the son, and who, whose son is he? Of the Father, which means God. He's God, he's the son of God. This is a son of God passage in, indisputably. Um, even people who are like the critical scholars, the ones who want to like 
really chop the gospels up and just remove most of them and be like, yeah, Jesus didn't really say that. Even, even those people who I think are off the rocker, <laughs> they would say, this is an authentic saying of Jesus. Like you can't find any way to support the idea that Jesus didn't say the whole phrase. That's pretty significant. So, you know, if a Muslim says, well, how come Jesus didn't know the day or hour? You have to ask them. So do you believe that Jesus said that? And if they say yes, then you can respond with, so Jesus is the son of God. Um, and uh, hopefully they'll realize that it's Islam that can't handle this verse. It's not Christianity that can't handle this verse. No, not at all. Now, there's also this hierarchy that I want to point out. So first off, no one knows that's humans. Not even the angels. That's the next level up. Then not even the sun, nor the sun. That means the sun is higher than the angels. The sun is higher than the angels. You could read Mark with this one question in your mind that will change your understanding of the gospel, Mark. Who does he think he is? He commands demons. He talks about having his own angels. He, he does things under his own authority. He, he, he says his words, and then he uses a term that describes God's words, where he goes, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That, dude, that's those are for God's words, not your words. And here he calls himself the son of the father, who's apparently above humans and angels. There he is way up there. Either Jesus is an egomaniac, or he is the son of God, right? Like either he is a lunatic thinking so highly of himself or he's God with us. Now to show you how important this is, this claim that he's higher than angels, look at Hebrews 1 with me. This is like the passage written, I think Hebrews 1 partly was written just to deal with Jehovah's Witness theology for whenever it did finally come around. Hebrews 1 verse 5. We're going to read through this. Look at what it says. Uh, here Hebrews 1 is comparing Jesus to angels. Jesus compared to angels. And notice how it, it exalts him. He's God. Okay, this is a this is a Jesus is God passage. And he's greater than the angels. Um, For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. God doesn't say this to the angels. This is something about Jesus. He's the son of the father. And that's unique to Jesus. It's unique to Jesus. Verse 6. And when again, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, uh, and let all the angels of God worship him. Let the angels worship him. Okay, wait, whoa. All the angels are to worship him? Who is this person? He's greater than the angels. They're to worship him. This is These are words you usually use to describe God, right? Verse 7, it gets stronger as we go. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, right? They're not physical and embodied, and they're, and they're servants. That's the nature of them. That's the nature of angels. They're not physical and embodied. And they're servants. They're ministers. That word is to serve. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. So of the Son, catch this. God the Father says about the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Not only is he not an angel, he is, he's God who sits on God's throne. Yeah, and you could debate this passage. I have, in my Trinity uh, teaching, I deal with this passage in more detail for those who try to re-translate it differently and stuff. But verse 9, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Again, he's called God. Verse 10, it gets worse for those who don't, don't see the deity of Christ in Scripture. And you, Lord. Notice that Lord. Notice how it's this like capital L, lowercase, capital O-R-D. Um, this is in, in the actual Hebrew, in the, in the passage that's being quoted from the Old Testament, this is the word Yahweh. And everything that's being said in context in Hebrews 1 is about the Son. It's the Father says these things about the Son. So here's, you know, he's of the Son, he says, and it has a quote. Then it says, and, which would be and what? He, of the Son, he says this, and he says this, and he says this. They're all things God, the Father says of the Son. You, Lord, you, Yahweh, in the beginning lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, They and they all will become old like a garment. Anyway, it, it goes on. The idea in Hebrews 1 um, is that Jesus is greater than the angels, and the significance of that is because he is God. He is God. He is, and, and here we have, in a sense, we have God talking to himself, right? But that's because we have multiple persons in God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Trinity just makes sense of all these doctrines, of all these teachings in Scripture. It's, it's forced upon us. 
But some would respond and they would say, I want to push back on that, Mike. Uh, in Job chapter one, it actually does say that angels are sons of God in Job one. Maybe I can quickly find the verse for you guys. Um, here we are in Job one. Um, Here we go. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. These are some kind of angelic beings. Is what it looks, That's how I understand Job and I think most people do. Uh, so in Job 1.6, they're called sons of God. Um, okay, first off, let me just say, the Bible is not written by one author or in one time. It's inspired by one, one in, in, inspirer, right, God. But it is written over a vast period of time and terms are used in different ways. So the term sons of God in Job 1.6 is referring to angels. They're called sons of God. But this is not at all the kind of exaltation language we get, say, in Hebrews 1. Look at what it says. In Hebrews 1.5, for which, to which of the angels did he ever say, not you're all categorized as sons of God, meaning like you're 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 my servants, you're the you're the ones who serve me and all that. Instead, he actually says, you are my son today, I've begotten you. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Even the terminology of the New Testament, it describes Jesus as the only begotten son. So clearly Jesus is different than the angels. Job is just using the term in a very different fashion and it shouldn't be ported over out of context into Hebrews or into Mark for that matter for uh, to be used out of context. Jesus is clearly a son in a very different and very unique sense. And Job, Hebrews 1 just straight up affirms that he is God. Now, this verse contains the paradox I mentioned earlier um, with, with the Muslims, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the sun. Uh, <laughs> I get excited about this stuff. Sorry. Uh, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the sun. That's that's one issue people, they're like bothered by. Conservatives sometimes have been bothered by the lack of knowledge that Jesus mentions here. But what's interesting is, you don't know this, is that liberals are also bothered by it for a different reason. Um, here I'm speaking conservative, liberal, in theological terms here. Most of us are often hearing the term in political. It's, they mean different things in, in the world of theology, and that's what I'm referring to. So the, the liberal theologians, um, they're going to be bothered by this as well, but for a different reason. Right? They're not bothered that Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour. They tend to like that sort of thing, right? Because they tend to like de-spiritualize, de-supernaturalize the Bible. But they're bothered by something else, right? Liberals are worried that Jesus is too personally aware of his sonship with the Father. Oh, I forgot to put it on the screen for you. Jesus is too aware of his sonship with the Father. It bothers them that Jesus is like openly saying that he's the son of God, right? He, he doesn't call himself son of man in this passage. He calls himself like the son of the Father. Contextually, he can only be talking about God because he calls God the Father in the very next uh, couple words. That's pretty significant, and liberals are bothered by this. Then again, this makes it ironic that Muslims use it because it affirms the thing they all want to deny, that Jesus was the Son of God, and for the liberals to hear this, that Jesus knew he was the Son of God because some of them want to act like Christianity is something that happened after Jesus' time and was sort of forced onto him, right? Like this was this was uh, the rise of, of Christianity came after, or, or some would say, oh, Paul hijacked Christianity and all this kind of thing. And these are all nonsense claims that can be talked about at length at other times. But here's one of those places that helps us push back on such claims. So th that's the paradox of the verse. And, and how, now how, how would a Christian respond? Well, we'd respond by just acknowledging all of it. Jesus didn't know. There was something he did not know. And he's the son of God. They're both true, right? He's human. He's divine. He's both. That's the biblical view. That's even this very verse is pushing it on us. And we need to just accept it all. He's both God and man. The two natures of Christ is the solution to this problem. He's human. He's truly human, truly divine. Uh, just as a reminder for those who maybe haven't heard me say it, I, I don't recommend saying he's 100% human and 100% God. The word percent is a clumsy phrase. And depending on how you take it, you've made him into 200%, which doesn't make sense on any reading of math, right? He's 200% of what? Wait, I'm... So it's just the terms percentage, right? Truly human, genuinely human. He was actually human and he was actually truly God, right? That there's a genuineness in those claims. Uh, that's the emphasis that Christians should have. And it's right here in the Bible. It's not just an invention. Uh, at the Council of Nicaea, for those who are very 
unaware of history, you might think that. <laughs> um, did Jesus do everything as a man? This is another question I want to ask. This kind of came up because I, I realized that there are those who are, say, part of, and I've been openly, I've discussed Bethel, uh, not because I'm mad at people at Bethel or something. I love them. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ for the most part. They really are. I believe that. Um, but I openly discuss them because I feel like their influence is growing in the world and there's some elements of their teaching that are off. And I'd like for people to at least hear another voice on the issue, right? I think that's a healthy thing for us to hear multiple voices. So one of the teachings that we get in, say, Bethel or from guys like Todd White, um, we get the teaching that Jesus did everything as a man and that this implies that whatever we see Jesus doing, we can sort of do the same thing. You know, when the rubber meets the road, this means that you can just go around and everyone, every Christian should expect to have direct words from the Lord, to prophesy, to do miracles everywhere you go. You should be able to clear out hospitals. Like this is the expectation that's being set. Now, they're not meeting that expectation at all, but that's the expectation that's constantly being taught and preached. And I think that it's a distortion of what scripture says, but I don't want to overreact. Now, some have overreacted, I think, to Bethel by suggesting Jesus didn't do anything as a man or something like that. Like that's like, no, no, the humanity of Christ is super important. I want to have that there. What I don't want to do is, is turn it into like a funhouse mirror where, and that's what I think Bethel does with Jesus. Okay. I think that there's the real, the real Jesus is there, but he's being looked at through a funhouse mirror where we over inflate certain aspects and under represent others. And that that creates anxiety in the body of Christ when it comes to things like miracles, because we're expecting things, but the, the, the same way that, and I've criticized before, um, some within my own, with my own group of churches movement of, of having overly predicting the future to the point of being embarrassing, right? They get so excited about predicting when the end times are going to come and how, what's going to lead to the mark of the beast, which I find to just be a bunch of a very reckless business that I think causes harm. But they're ex it's exciting and it, and it stirs up evangelism, uh, which we need to stir up evangelism and be excited, but it doesn't have to be that. Okay, there's other ways. In the same way, in a parallel sense, Bethel, their excitement, their distortion relates to miracles and supernatural things, wanting so much to see so much of those things that we will then create embarrassment. And I, I do think that's going on there. Um, but there is a teaching called kenosis that I want to mention real quick kenosis Th this is this is a teaching that i as far as i know bethel doesn't hold it now but don't take my word for it because i haven't read all their books if they hold it this is a, this is a heresy okay if people are holding this teaching it's absolutely heresy and that would be the opposite of um what i talked about earlier this would be to deny not the humanity of christ but to deny the deity of christ so that jesus kenosis doesn't say jesus was never god right the kenosis says that that, that god the word right he became flesh and he basically ceased being God at that point. Now, some say it clearly like that. He stopped being God. He, he did everything as a man. What they really mean in that case is he was just a man. Uh, others will, will say it a different way. They'll say, well, he's still God in a sense, but he just, he lacks the attributes of God. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. He's not any of those things. Now, if he actually lacks, the, see, I'm saying he doesn't use those attributes. I'm not saying he doesn't have them. There's a difference there, right? If Jesus, though, he doesn't even have the attributes of what we what looks like it's essential to be God is to be omni, omni, all these things, right? And if he doesn't have those, then he just seems to not be God anymore. And that would be kenosis. This is a, 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 it comes from the Philippians where it says he emptied himself. And then they take that word and they label the doctrine with that. But they define emptying as he just like was no longer, he no longer had those attributes. Um, I don't think that's right. That's not what scripture is teaching. And it's what the church has historically always said is like straight up heresy. Um, Bethel does flirt with that a little bit, but they, I don't think that they're teaching it. I hope not. I sure hope not. Um, maybe if I read more of their material, I'd find more clarity on that. I know a lot of you guys are convinced that they're teaching it. I haven't seen it in their actual works. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, it's also a rumor until I know for sure that it's there. Um, so I'm, you can't help people in a movement that has some uh, some issues if we won't represent them accurately. And I want to make sure I do that with, uh, with Bethel. So here's how your debate goes. Did Jesus know or did he not know? But the Muslim challenges you, did he know or did he not know? Did he know or did he not know? If he was God, he would know. But it says here he didn't know, so he therefore he can't be God. And so I want you guys to do me a favor. And, and I would you could ask someone to do that, uh, to do this as well, if they ask you this question. Is you ask them to do this. And you don't have to. Do what you want. You're in control. <laughs> but uh, I'd ask you to close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. 
Um, and assuming you're watching video and you're not listening on podcasts, this would work for you if you're on video. So close your eyes for a moment. Don't do it if you're driving, please. Um, <laughs> and uh, close your eyes for a minute and I'll ask you the question, can you see me with your eyes closed? Can you see me right now? And you would have to answer, no, I can't see you right now. I don't see you. But if I was to conclude you lack the ability to see me, that would be a wrong conclusion because you have self-limited your ability to see by closing your eyes. I think that Jesus can do this with his knowledge, right? He has the ability to close his, himself off to the knowledge he has. Now, we can sort of do this as humans. I'm much more limited, you know. I can kind of like try not to think about something. I can avoid thinking about a thing. Sometimes there are even things that I know that I just can't bring to my mind. And it may have been like that. It may have been that Jesus knows that somewhere he knows this, but he's not bringing it to his mind because he has the human limitations he's subjecting himself to on purpose, like closing your eyes. And in that same, you can open your eyes again, by the way. <laughs> in that same sense, though, the um, uh, the idea here is that that Jesus could have had like sort of, you know, there is knowledge he has, but he's not accessing it now. And in that sense, he's like, the son does not know. I don't know. That's pretty significant. I think that actually makes a lot of sense. I have this all the time. Sometimes in Q&As, I'll be asking, asked a question and I'll think, man, I did a whole project on this. I have the knowledge back there. And it'll be after the Q&A, like a day later, I'll be like, boom, I remember all that stuff. And it's and for me, in my head, it's almost like I open a, a, a folder and all of a sudden all this information floods out. So it's like I can't remember anything about it. And then suddenly I remember everything about it. But I had the knowledge. It was always there. I just couldn't access it. We're familiar with that kind of thing. I think Jesus is experiencing something similar to that. He can know the hour, right? He has omniscience. He can use it, but he chooses to have a self-imposed limitation so he doesn't know it. All right, here's the next question. Does Jesus know now? Here's another question I had as I was prepping for my study, right? Does Jesus know now, right now? Does Jesus know the time of his return? Now, some would say no. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he continues to have self-imposed limitations. And I'm okay with that. Theologically, I'm okay with that. But I'm going to build a case. I'm going to call it a case, right? It, it, it's not definitive, but I think it gives us direction. I think this is in the direction of suggesting, yes, Jesus knows now. Okay, so Philippians 2, I'm going to share with you three passages of scripture about this. Um, speaking of who Christ is, what he's like, he was... Um, existed in the form of God, okay, there's the deity of Christ clearly, did not regard equality God, with God a thing to be grasped, so he chose to come become lower than God. Just as he says, the Father's greater than I, he lowers himself, right? He's right there, but he lowers himself. But emptied himself, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So we get the description of Jesus coming from heaven to earth here. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now we get what happens after the cross, right? He came, he humbled himself, came down, he emptied himself. But what happens next? For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that every name uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What I'm going to suggest for my first piece in my puzzle of, of um, building a case that Jesus knows now when the hour of his return is going to be and just and I could be wrong here. This is but here's my case. Is that in principle Jesus did this like down up thing. And we get this in Philippians where it talks about he emptied himself and then he died, he rose, he's glorified. There's a glorification. We see it in the gospels where the glorified risen Christ, there's something different about him now. He's not the same as when he was on the earth. Right? So here's the first piece in the puzzle. Things changed after the resurrection of Christ. Things changed in relation to Jesus's glory, in relation to Jesus having emptied himself. Right, that, that he, he set those things aside or re refused to use those things and took on human form. There's something different now. He's glorified. So that's the first piece in the puzzle. Um, he's still human, right? but things have changed. So in Act 1, when Jesus is, after he's risen, they ask him a similar question as they did earlier on. So they come together and they want to know, just like they did in Mark 13, Lord, when are you going to do this? When, when is it going to happen? When's the, when's the restoration of all things? So Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus' answer is a little different than before. It doesn't answer our question clearly, but we can note the differences. It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power, and then he tells them there will be witnesses. Notice he doesn't say anything about himself knowing, or the angels for that matter. 
There's no statement about whether the angels know or not, nor does he say only the fathers know, only the father knows. Here he just says the father has fixed it by his own authority. The date's been chosen and the father has chosen it and it's not for you to know. Okay, that this is just an argument from silence perhaps, but I'll just say this. It's interesting. It's interesting that here it's different. Um, so the third piece in the puzzle would be Revelation. I won't go to Revelation. Um, oh, I forgot to put it on the screen again. Sorry. I won't go to Revelation right now, but just know this, that Revelation, um, it's it's a revelation that the Father gave to... Oh, I will go to Revelation. Revelation one let Let's just look at how it's written here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. So the, the book of Revelation, the information, the data, the prophecy, the future knowledge that's in Revelation is something that the Father gave to, to Jesus to show to John. Now, it's understandable why he would give it to him if you understand like the, the, the self-limiting knowledge. But there's some hint in Revelation that God the Father g gave that permission or I, I would look at it that way, gave that in, in initiative to open up the knowledge of the end times. So Revelation has a subtle argument here that Jesus knows at least more about the day and the hour than he did when he was walking the earth, right? This information has been given and now there's more details in Revelation. So I admit this is, I could, I could easily be wrong here. I think that if I have to guess, I'm going to guess based upon the best available information and the best available information I have suggests to me Jesus does know the day and the hour right now. Now, Think about how this impacts your view of Jesus. He was really human. And he, he if, if this is right, if we're understanding scripture right, he wasn't constantly accessing omniscience nor power. He was like really living a human life. We also read in scripture that he was tempted in every way like me and you. He felt your weakness and your futility, your your powerlessness. We all know what it feels like to be powerless, to be like, I can't do that. I don't have the ability to fix that. And there was all sorts of things that Jesus would have had to feel this about, I think. It was self-limited, but it was it was causing him to have our experience. He had the human experience. I mean, just think, from, from the time of his birth until he's 30, it appears Jesus did no miracles. He had conversations in the temple at 12, and that's it. When, when he does do miracles, his own family doesn't believe him. This means that they, his own family, his, his brothers and sisters, they thought he's not a miracle worker because he lived with human weakness for 30 years, limitations and weaknesses that he suffered alongside you and me. And when you realize how much he's identified with us, how he took on our form and took on our lives, when, when he's in the garden of Gethsemane and we read right before his crucifixion that he was so stressed out, so full of anxiety and just grief that he's his, the capillaries in his blood vessels are, bre are breaking because of the stress and he's sweating blood. And that is a real medical condition. All it, it makes me just say, wow, Jesus, you really went through this for me. You are God almighty and you took on my form, my weaknesses, and you really bore those things. And it creates appreciation in my heart for when I see Jesus going through things. I think it's really powerful, really powerful. Okay, now I, more issues. This is a prophetic question I'm going to ask now as we're going through this passage, right? Um, what does day or hour mean? What does Jesus mean by day or hour? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there are some who have, and I already talked about this previously, and I don't want to harp. Uh, it's not really my goal here. But but I want to, I mean, this is this is the scripture at hand. Let's ask the question. When Jesus says no one knows the day or hour, does he mean, per, for those who want to be, predicting the future, trying to predict what's going to happen next. You know, always looking at current events and trying to predict the future. Um, again, I'm not completely opposed to this. I think it can be done responsibly, but I rarely see that happen, if ever. I mean, do we ever see that happen? I don't know. Um, but when he says no one knows the day or the hour, does he perhaps mean you don't know the calendar date and the time of day, which means you could still guess at the month, the season, the year, the decade? Can you still guess at those things? Can you maybe figure those things out? Can you add together what the scripture says and figure, okay, um, you know, beginning of the tribulation, here's the midway point, here's the end, here's my calendar, these are the years, these are the dates. 
Is that what that means? Because that's how I think Pastor Chuck Smith had taken this passage that based on me reading between the lines as I look at his works, because he says, I'm not giving a date. And then he says 1981. So, so yeah, that seems like he was viewing it that way. Is that what it means? Um, so I decided to study this topic. And I'll say this first, almost every time the phrase day or hour, the, the, the tours day and hour, when they appear together in a verse in the New Testament, it's like a literal day and a literal hour. It is literal. It just really means like calendar day, time of day. Um, but... That being granted, I'm going to argue now that that's not what Jesus means in this passage. And there's several specific reasons that will help build the case. So hear me out on this. Mark 13, 32, Jesus' first point, Jesus does not say the day. He says that day or hour. Um, Now, that might not seem significant to you, but the phrase that day, that hour, the the way it's constructed is the only time it occurs in in the synoptics, in, in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's the only time that that phrase occurs. It has Old Testament connotations about prophetically a day of the Lord. And if you've ever done a study on the day of the Lord, that is a whole time season. It could be really long. It could be really short. It's not. It's a very generic term. It could mean a wide period of time. So it's not just the day or hour. It's that day. And that is significant when you look at the Old Testament and its use of the same term. And that does create the backdrop for understanding Mark. Um in Mark 13, 33, Jesus, not only does he say, you don't know the day or the hour, but he also says they do not know when the appointed time will come. Now he just adds the phrase, the time. You don't know when the time will come. Now that's generic for sure. Even if you think day and hour are very literal, time is a very generic sense and that's how it's used. And I'll give you some examples here. And again, I'm just trying to say, this is why you shouldn't predict the month or the year or the decade. Like, just give it up. <laughs> just stop. Um, as a premillennial, and I could be wrong, maybe, maybe, maybe the postmillennials are correct. Maybe the amillennials are right. Like, if you're a premillennial like me, I'm saying even on our side, you shouldn't be predicting the day and the hour, or the season, or the month. Um, the time of the time is fulfilled, right? Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What's fulfilled? The time. And then Jesus here refers to the entire time of his entire three year plus ministry. And the continued time going after that when the gospel is going out and going out and going out. He's referring to the time to respond to this new information about Jesus. So he's referring to a very large period of time. He uses the phrase, the time, in a very wide generic sense. This happens again in other places. Um, In Mark 10.30, it represents the present age. Or all the time, the phrase the time, represents all the time between Jesus and now. And the final kingdom when it comes. In Mark 11.13, it refers to a time of year like the season for figs. In Mark 12, 12, it refers to harvest time. Again, a time of year, like the season for figs. Jesus in Mark, in Mark 13, 33, he uses it very generically. You don't know when the appointed time will be. My point, in case I lost anyone, is I'm saying you don't know the day or hour, which could actually be generic because of the phrase that day or hour. You also don't know the time when it will come, which could refer to any length of time. So you shouldn't be guessing the month either. Well, I know it'll happen during this Feast of Israel. I don't go there. Why? Because Feasts of Israel are interesting and maybe they do correspond to the coming. But but I'm told I don't know. So why do I think that I know? I think I'm going to just take God's word. Also in Acts, when I mentioned this verse earlier, I didn't point out what he says about the timing. Acts 1, 6, and 7. Here, um, where did I go? Acts 1, 16. There it is. Acts 1, 6, and 7, they ask, when are you, you know, is now the time? And then Jesus, notice they ask him, is now the, is it at this time, which was, is it going to happen now? Is it going to happen today? Is it going to happen soon? And he says, it's not for them to know the times or epochs. This is a, a good verse for this, okay? You are not to know the times or the epochs. Another term you could put there is seasons, but it's pluralized. Seasons plural, times plural, and used in a very generic sense. This is clearly very general language. So if you think, well, I don't know the day or the hour, but I know the month and I know the year. I don't think that's consistent with Acts 1 verse 7, where Jesus says, it's not given to you to know the times and the epochs. Now your response might be, yeah, but we figured it out. We've read the writings. No, 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 guys, you're reading the writings of the guys to whom it was not given to know. How do I know what they didn't know in their own writings? They didn't know. It wasn't for them. It's not It's not for them. If it's not for the apostles, how is it for me? It's just not for me. 
It's just not for me. So let me put this together, what we've looked at a few things here. Um, we don't know the day and the hour, but it's that day, which could be generic. We don't know the time, that's in Mark 13. We don't know the times and the seasons, pluralized. In other words, you just don't know, so stop. This is, this is, <laughs> this is my emphasis. Christians, those of you who get excited about predicting the future, you're off the reservation when it comes to understanding fulfilled prophecy. I think you're off the reservation. You, <clears throat> If you look at your own track record of how much you've been wrong, or perhaps the, the last few generations, just go to a study on books from the 70s where they were predicting what they how they thought Scripture was being fulfilled and learn some humility in this. Please, please, for all of our sakes, right? Because it's, it's embarrassing. And it does cause some people to fall away because they can't tell the difference between your predictions and what Scripture actually says. And when your prediction doesn't come to pass then they get discouraged because they think that reflects on scripture, but that was just you. And I, I've heard uh, recently there was a pastor on YouTube and I haven't checked into this, but someone told me, so let's say hypothetically, there's a pastor on YouTube suggesting, you know, he's doing studies on how the COVID-19 vaccine could be leading to the mark of the beast. Can I just be on record, guys? I think this is reckless, reckless, reckless. It's a bad idea. This is creating paranoia. Like, I could do studies all day long about things that could become the mark of the beast and I'll just make you paranoid about living in the world. We just have to stop. We just, you have to stop. Stop, <laughs> please. And if you're listening to people and they sound very convincing, if you respect me, I would just encourage you this, at least take it with a grain of salt, please. Jesus says no one knows. How does that pastor know? Or is it just fun for him to guess? Well, it, that fun is, has a cost. It has a cost. Now, let me reinforce all this. I can make it even more clear by looking at the application Jesus has for us. So in Mark 13, Jesus gives us the following application. Verse 33, he says, Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know the appointed uh, when the appointed time will come. It's like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, this is us guys, we have tasks to do, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. Do you catch the, there's a cause and effect here. Jesus says, you don't know, and the, re, the, the reason why I don't want you to know is so you'll be on the alert. You don't know, so you'll be on the alert. But prophecy hobbyists, they sometimes... They, and now, there's nothing wrong with, you know, I love prophecy, digging into prophecy. That's not the problem here. Predicting, people who are addicted to predicting, the prediction addiction, okay, <laughs> let's just call that. The prediction addiction people, um, what they want to think is that because we know it's coming, you know, around the corner next year, five years, we know that now we can have alertness. We're going to be on alert because we do know. Jesus is saying the opposite. You're going to be on the alert because you don't know. Let that, let that bomb drop into the prediction addiction environments. You'll be on the alert because you don't know. Jesus is giving a word, this is important, that's meant for every generation to be on the alert. The only way to keep every generation on the alert when you have a long di future distant second coming is to just not tell any of them because he knows that we're irresponsible. We need to get focused and stay focused on Jesus. And if you knew that he wasn't coming for a thousand years, like if you were alive in 1000 AD and fervor is going on, they're like, it's been a thousand years since Christ came. He's going to come back it's just, because, because God will do, he likes math. He'll do a thousand years for sure. And if you were thinking that and someone came to you and said, actually, it's going to be another thousand years at least before he returns, you might get discouraged and become lazy and start living for this world. Jesus wants you to be alert and awake. He, he just knows that if we know how long the wait is, we'll get discouraged. The reality is you really only wait one lifetime and you need to live that life for Jesus Christ. Not knowing is what keeps us on guard. Pro pr prediction addiction people, <laughs> copyright Mike Winger, trademark, no. Uh, prediction addiction people, they think that knowing keeps you on alert. And that's the flaw that I see um, and have seen many times. So Jesus, his attitude then is, um, you know, you need to be watching, you need to be waiting, you have tasks, you're like the, the master, he's coming to the house, I should read the rest of these verses, and then I'll comment on them. Um, you don't know when the master's coming, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep, what I say to you, 
I say to all, be on the alert. So not knowing makes me alert. That's the application. That's what I'm supposed to do. And the uh, parable here, it is a parable here. There's a master coming. You're the servants or the slaves, depending on your translation here. And you're the ones who are given tasks. You have jo a job to do. Now, here's where I want to comment on this. This is like a real practical Christian living thing, but it's something that I've, it took me a long time to sort of learn this. Um, and scripture teaches it. It's not like it wasn't in the Bible there. It just took me, sometimes we see it in the Bible, but it still takes us a long time to sort of like absorb that reality. I used to think that I was like sort of living life waiting on some great task that God would have me do. Um, the problem with that mentality is that it can cause us to devalue the things we're doing now because we think that we're just waiting around for that future glorious thing. There's some big thing coming and God's going to use you in a great way one of these days. Maybe it'll just be one great moment, you know. The problem with that view is I, I, I stop looking at my daily tasks as if they're tasks for the Lord. And that's not a biblical mentality. The biblical mentality is whatever you, I'm reading to you, Colossians, I'll put it on screen. Why? Because you'll remember it better if you see it. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, whatever, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Whatever you're doing, do it for the Lord. That There is a way to live every day of your life and everything you do every day of your life for the Lord. That's your task as a Christian. Everything is for God. Don't find the thing God wants you to do. Do everything for God. That's the big lesson. And that's the whole story. There may or may not be some massive great work that you're aware of in your life. But there are a million things to do for the Lord. And your job is just to be faithful in those things. You may discover some really great thing, but that discontent that like what you're doing now is like you're a pastor, but you don't have a good, you don't have a big enough church. You're, you're, you're helping in children's ministry, but you're like, there's just kids. Like, I don't know. I feel like I should do something more important. Or you, you have a job and you're serving the Lord well in it. Maybe you're a good parent. You're, you're a good, you're a good student. You're a good child. And you feel like that's not enough. I want to encourage you that that's enough. Like it's enough to do that. And I, I learned this lesson. It, you might be like, well, that's, Mike, that's great. You know, look, you know, you've got this really great ministry. It's reaching lots of people. And the funny thing is, when I was younger, that's what I was hoping for, was this really big ministry that would reach a lot of people. Now, I don't think because of vanity. I, I think because that's where I saw value. What's interesting is after, after years of doing ministry, I like totally gave up on that. And I just was trying to be faithful. Like, I found myself trying to be faithful without, with, I, I hope this is helpful to somebody, but without needing for the thing I'm doing to have great success. I just the faithfulness itself, the task, that's what I'm called to do. And so then when online ministry started really growing and doing well and stuff, I mean, it did grow because of labor and work, hard work and lots of years and all that. But but I was content long, long, long ago when it was a lot smaller. I would be content if it was way smaller than it is now. I'd be perfectly happy. Like it's all just extra. And my, the reason why I share all this with you is because whatever you've got going on, this is a thing you need to do for the Lord. Whatever your job is, whatever your situation is, your family relationships, your friendships, uh, your free time, use, use it all just in giving honor and glory to God. Even just in enjoying something you do on your free time, to be thankful to God for it, right? To keep it pure and holy and that kind of thing. But I, I remember once I encountered a youth pastor, this was many years ago, and we were talking, and I'm, I'm a youth pastor, he's a youth pastor, so he decided to open up a bit, and he says, Mike, um, I hardly even study anymore for my studies. And I was like, what? And he says, honestly, I don't think the kids pay that much attention, and I don't think they remember most of what I say. So I hardly even study anymore. And I, I maybe I should have, like, openly said, like, you're blowing it, you know, I I just, I was so saddened by that and I didn't know how to fix it. And I just sat there dumbfounded. Um, I study a lot and I always have, um, and I've never regretted that. And I would teach things to the students. And I just, in my head, I just thought, well, A, I'm being faithful and B, you know, sure, they'll forget things, but it'll still have an impact in their life today. And maybe God will bring it back to their mind when they need it, you know. And um, how discouraging that he thought his, his task as a youth pastor, he had gotten to the point of thinking that there was no point in laboring hard at serving God and what he was doing. I, I doubt he's in ministry anymore, or maybe he's had a real radical change. Who knows? Who knows? So I need as a Christian to have an attitude that Jesus is coming. This is the application. Um, every generation of Christians is supposed to anticipate the possible coming in their generation. Anticipating and predicting 
are not the same thing. I don't, I want to throw out the predicting that has been going on in the church. I do not want to lose the anticipating. That is something Jesus is laboring to get to instill in us. He's like, you don't know, so you better be ready. This is the lesson. Get ready now. Jesus, whenever he returns, whenever this end and glorious future starts to happen, you need to be ready. You need to be ready. Each generation anticipating, just don't predict. Avoid the flaw of predicting and avoid the flaw of not anticipating. If your solution to people overly predicting the future is to say, ah, Jesus is probably just going to come back in like a thousand, five, ten thousand years. I'm not going to worry about it. Like that's actually the wrong attitude to have. Be ready now. You need to have, here, here's one way to put it. Um, Jesus coming in my generation, question mark. That's good. I like that. Jesus coming in my generation, exclamation point. That's bad. That's the difference between anticipating and predicting. So have that attitude that he's coming as opposed to like laziness, as opposed to just ignoring the future, as opposed to looking around at your life and just getting so comfortable living kind of a compromised lifestyle. This is where the rubber meets the road for you and me. Like, are you living for Jesus every day, all the time? That's the question. And that doesn't mean reading your Bible 24 hours a day. You have a shallow view of, and I'm not meaning to insult you here. I'm, I'm encouraging you. You have a shallow view of what it means to serve God. Like you've you've limited serving God to reading the Bible. Like that's important, but like serving God is like how you react to your parents or your wife or your friend. Serving God is 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 that you get to work on time for His glory. Serving God is that you're you're a person of integrity, that you share the gospel as you have opportunities. Um, Serving God is that you would you enjoy like let's let's say you you have your glass of wine and again I still don't drink but let's say you have your glass of wine and you enjoy it under the Lord and that and that's why you, you're able to say thank you God that was wonderful and then not have four glasses because you're gonna you're gonna be sinning against God so in your enjoyment you keep it holy like there's a way to honor and glorify God in your life um, you play a video game but you don't play a compromising one or you don't play it for so long that you're you know betraying responsibilities to family and work and stuff like that. These are ways you serve God in your life that you're ready for him to return. If Jesus came back right now, would you be ashamed of the last week? Or would you be like, yes, <laughs> like I, I, you know, come back in two weeks, Jesus. I just want to have a little time to, to like live well for you. Would, would that be the attitude? Like you got to be ready for him to return at all times. That's, that's the teaching in scripture. That's the teaching in scripture. I think if we could calculate the year, it would actually be dangerous for us because it would cause us to be lazy because most generations throughout the Christian history would know that it's not going to happen before they die and that that ends up being unhealthy for us. Anticipation is a healthy Christian thing. Jesus coming back soon. That's a healthy thing to hope for and be ready for. You just have a question mark on it instead of an exclamation point. Now, the interesting thing here, though, is this. God doesn't want us to know, right? I'm not supposed to know right now. I'm not even intended to know. So I should stop trying to calculate everything and predict the predict the signs that will lead to the signs that will lead to the signs. And this is just an unhealthy obsession that I think prediction addiction that's gone on. But on the other side, when you are in the end times, he suddenly wants everyone to know that they're in it because he gives clear signs, the abomination of desolation, cosmic signs, and then the return of Christ is coming fairly soon after that. And then he wants them to know. I think that's really interesting. Why does he want that generation to know and nobody else? Look, because here's the kind of strange thing is if you're not there, he wants you to be ready in case it comes and to be serving him faithfully. But if you're in the middle of it, that is when there is such intense persecution and so much suffering and such uh, theological lies and delusions and false Christianity that's going to be so heavy in that moment that we're going to need the encouragement if we're that generation. We need the encouragement of knowing it's temporary, guys. Just hang on. It will be so dark, it will be so rough that they will just need to know whoever's still around for that time, right? Whatever your your belief is on the rapture. Like if you think of the rapture, well, then I'm talking about the Christians that are there um, get saved during the time. But th that group is going to need to know, need, need, need to know that it's just temporary and that help is on its way and that Christ is going to return and they just need to endure till the end. This prophecy of Jesus in Mark 13 will suddenly encourage them in a whole new fashion. Revelation will suddenly be looked at in a different way because it, it won't be like, this could be this, this could be, no, no. It'll be like, dude, this is happening now. There's no doubt about it. And then they'll laugh at everybody who predicted things ahead of time and how silly they were. Um, but right now, not knowing will help you. 
Knowing will help the generation that's in it, but not knowing will help everybody else up until that time. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. Not knowing is to lead you to take heed and keep on the alert. If Jesus came back right now, would you be happy with the life that you've been living? That's the question. And probably for all of us, there's some immediate corrections that you think of. Go for it. Make those corrections. Don't have a hopeless, oh, I blew it, I may as well give up and quit attitude. That is a really bad attitude. <laughs> Instead, say, okay, the clarity of Christ's possible return, I suddenly look at my life and see it with clarity. I just see it the way it is. My obedience to Christ, my love for the Lord, my my all of it, it just it all just becomes crystal clear in light of the possible coming of Christ. That's the clarity Jesus wants to give us. And that, I think, is our major lesson from Mark 13 and from all the prophecy stuff. The whole lesson is basically you buckle down, serve Christ, be ready for his return, live for him in this life. Next week, we're going to cover beginning the beginning of the cross right we're going to talk about the suffering that they're going through in mark 14 the the things leading up to the suffering the 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 passover begins we're literally days from the cross in the gospel of mark just a, just a few days from the cross right now and and we're heading into it here in mark 14 as we approach easter i don't know how far i'll get before easter we'll see how it goes i'm not really gonna try and force anything and also Wednesday, I have an interview I did that you guys can look forward to on the channel uh, talking about the re evidence for the resurrection of Christ with Mario, who is a, a Belgian teenager who gave his life. He was an atheist, gave his life to Christ, and the evidence for the resurrection played a central role in that. It was very important for him. And he, it's, the cool story is he wrote a paper in his in his class, in his I guess his equivalent of high school. I don't know what, what they've got. I didn't, I didn't ask him. But his school, he wrote a paper, and it's like a year project, a major project they're doing, defending the resurrection. His teacher pushed back and gave objections. So there's like that kind of, you know, battle of ideas going on there in the school. He then had to interview somebody, so he interviewed me. I talked about the evidence for the resurrection, and then we answered his teacher's objections. And then he talked some of, about some of his story as well. That, that interview and all that stuff is going to be going up on my channel uh, Wednesday morning, which is two days from now, depending on... <laughs> what time zone you're all in so that's about it thank you all so much for joining i really appreciate the um uh the excitement that you share with me so i here's the thought if you're bible teachers i have a last thought for you totally has nothing to do with today's study but last thought i was just thinking about it earlier so i have a strategy about getting my wife to eat food she doesn't like <laughs> here's my strategy um and it relates to bible teaching i promise the strategy is I eat food in front of her and enjoy it because I do enjoy it. And I don't try to force her to eat it. I just enjoy it. And oddly enough, this works on people all over the place. You just eat food and enjoy it in front of them. There's a tendency they have to go, I kind of want to try that. Like that looks good. You look like you're enjoying that. And one of my philosophies of the Bible study is I truly enjoy the word of God and I enjoy teaching it and I enjoy the discoveries of scripture and I enjoy getting tough questions and, and good answers and um, and the admonitions. I have g genuine joy in these things. And one of my thoughts is that there are people who've been just, they just, Bible study doesn't taste good to them. But if if in our teaching as, as, as teachers, those of you who are teachers, if in our teaching we really dr truly enjoy and love the word of God and we enjoy teaching it, we study a passage until you're excited about it, right? And then you teach it, they're going to see you enjoying the meal and it will cause them to want it too. So this is this is why I say I'm going to make Bible nerds out of everybody, if, if, if possible, is I'm going to enjoy it so much that you start enjoying it too and you see the goodness and the wonder and the, and the blessingness that we have is that a word? No. Uh, in scripture that we have as we study the, the word of God and you're like, my goodness, there's so much goodness that is here in the word of God. That's all. Lord bless you.